As I was growing my life, transforming my business, I copycat game changers. And what I found out was game changers were always attending another summit, a place where they can grow, a place where they can expand, and a place where they can network. So I myself did the exact same thing. And I looked up one day and I was that game changer. Not at the top of the game by some, but definitely not where I used to be. So if you're a game changer or you're striving to truly be a game changer, then you don't want to miss the Wealth Summit. Me and my girl Constance Carter and a bunch of other amazing, brilliant individuals will be joining together on February 2nd, 2019 at Waterfront University Plaza Hotel. You don't want to miss it. This is where transformation occurs. If you want to get something new, you simply have to know something new. And I'll be sharing the tips and secrets of how financial transformation occurs. How not only to make more money, but how to keep more money and how to grow money. How to grow your impact, how to grow, scale your business, how to attract more consumers, how to create a tribe, how to do those things that's gonna last a lifetime and help you write the legacy that you wanna write. But in order to get there, you have to be in the room. So I invite you, register, don't walk, but run. It is limited space and you definitely want to reserve your seat. I'll see you there. now tuned in to Hot Topics with Lady Charmaine, and I'm your host, Lady Charmaine, and we have a very special Hot Topics show for you tonight. Now, if you have not heard of the Surviving R. Kelly docuseries, then you've probably been hidden under a rock. If you got, haven't gotten a chance to view it, I'm sure you heard about it, among with the other millions of people, and many of us was very disturbed by what we saw, although we may have heard the stories years ago, and some of us really didn't even take them seriously, but this docuseries opened up our eyes and many of us and our hearts went out to every last one of those women and one of those women they're here today to share their story and also to share their story to encourage other women to share their stories also enlighten you in case you were that girl and also to be able to help you with your daughters and how they maybe may not be able to get caught up like they did but she's here to share her story and I want you to help me welcome to the show Miss Lizette Martinez welcome to the show Thank you, Lady Charmaine. I love your name, by the way. It's so regal and beautiful. Oh, thank you, Lizette. You are such a sweet lady. And I really enjoyed talking to you on thank last you. week. So I'm glad you were able to make it to the show. I know that uh, you were ill when you were supposed to come on the show. So I'm glad you were able to make it to the show tonight. So thank you so much for coming on the show. And I want to say thank you for being so brave to share your story with millions of people and putting yourself out there in such a vulnerable uh, situation. But it really helped a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It hasn't been easy, but it's necessary, and um, women need support, so, and so that's how, what I'm here for. And I want to know, how has your life been since this docu-series aired? Well, you know, it's it's a lot because, you know, we're, we're regular women, mm -hmm. you know, and to have your name and faith everywhere, it's a bit challenging. However, I received so many messages from people that have seen it and supported and, you know, men, women, teenagers, mothers, everyone, you know, across the board basically uh, has reached out and helped me because you, you, you hear the backlash and those things get to you a bit, but I'm a strong woman, so I'm good. <laughs> Well, I am so sure you are definitely a strong woman because we were able, you know, to see that and the vulnerability that you had on the show. Now, I know you also have children. Did you have to have a conversation with your children before this aired? And if you did, what was that conversation like? Yes, I do. I have twins and they were, they're, you know, the age that I was when I met him. So, um, yeah, I did have a conversation. I have a boy and a girl, mm -hmm. so... I did have to have the conversation with them and prepare them because it's not only me, you know, we're very mm -hmm. close and, um, 
I wanted to prepare them for what was coming. And they're very supportive and very, like, resilient kids. So they're strong. You know, I hope they get that from me. But they, um, in their own right, they are wonderful human beings. So uh, you have a daughter. And when did your children mm-hmm. find out your story regarding you and R. Kelly? What age were they when you finally opened up and told them? It was before the BuzzFeed um, article, which happened this past year. Mm. Um, I had to prepare them for that because that was a big deal as well. That was my first you know, time talking about it publicly. Mm-hmm. And um, basically, you know, my kids are uh, aspiring artists, and I definitely had to talk with them about people in the industry and how the industry can be. Mm-hmm. And that they need to be very careful of who they entrust. Because, you know, we all have dreams. Mm-hmm. And it's easy for someone to pray, to pray on that. And so that was the conversation. And they've seen me go through a lot. You know, I don't want to get too much into it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, after that, when they were young, and we all went through a lot mm-hmm. at the hands of someone else. And so we are sort of like wounded but we're strong, like I said, so um, they get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they get it. Their, t- their team was their, their team was that. <laughs> okay, you know, okay. We three musketeers. <laughs> okay, uh, we, we, which is good <laughs> to know. And you have a daughter, so, because, you know, sometimes when people go through certain things, they're very overprotective over their children, and especially their daughters. And you said your children are aspiring artists. So how do you prepare your daughter for something like that? And are you nervous for her, or do you feel that she's equipped now because of the things you may have told her? Listen, my daughter's stronger than me. I mean, sometimes she's like, Mom, you know, you're so nice. You know, so she's like, she's very smart. Um, I am like vigilant with my kids, especially mm-hmm. my daughter. She is just drop dead gorgeous inside and out. And she is a lot like me in that she's very sweet. So someone could get it, you know, prey on that. But I've prepared her. And she, like I said, is even stronger than I am. So I'm not really worried. And I'm like them. I'm on like white on rice with these kids. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm. <laughs> now I want, I want. And you know, now they have. They have Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, I want to clear up some misconceptions because a lot of people are saying that you came forward because you did it for the money. Now, did you do this for the money? No. Thank you. If that was the case, I would have sued him when I was a kid. Okay. Okay. It wasn't about the money. Mm -hmm. I was a wounded young woman who tried to go on with her life as best that she could. And I came out because from the beginning, I've always said to everyone I've always spoken to that I came out for the young women that are still in that house. Mm -hmm. I call it the house of horrors. Mm -hmm. Okay. With him. And these parents that I saw were, were just being, you know, tossed around with bloggers. I mean, this story is bigger than that. These, right. these, these, this, these families have been fighting for years. And you can't put the blame on them. Many people have recorded with Robert after the, the, the trial. You know, it was a business situation. So I don't criticize them. I'm standing with them and I came out for them and their daughters. Absolutely. We didn't get paid. I go to a nine to five every day and I have to sit there and listen to all the nonsense online. I mean, I don't have to, but it comes across and I still have to pay my bills and I still have to live a regular life and still with, you know, and still be there for other women. And it just is genuine and it's from my heart. Absolutely. And now I want to talk to you about your story because we learned from watching the docuseries that you actually ran into R. Kelly in a mall. And how old were you when you ran into Right. Him? And how old were you? Uh, I was 17. I met him at a mall in Miami. I was just going there with some friends to basically window shop. We couldn't afford <laughs> anything, you know, buy anything. We just <laughs> like to go. <laughs> you know, that's the thing to do in Florida and Miami. Go to the mall after school. <laughs> right. So it was just a typical day. And you said um, in the docuseries, we also learned that one of his uh, people that worked for him gave you R. Kelly's number because R. Kelly wanted you to call him. Right. And so right. You, you were very excited. And go ahead. 
I was excited because you're seeing someone that you like love, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't really love him, but I was a singer in an R&B group. And ironically, the first concert that I've ever, that I had ever gone to was his concert. Mm -hmm. And that was like a year, maybe a year and a half before I actually met him at the mall. Okay. So that was kind of weird. But um, we went just for like, just to see what an artist does on stage. And, like, our manager wanted to take us to see, you know, the performance and stuff like that. But I remember vividly after the concert, they had signs, like, girls come backstage. Like, they were walking around with signs, girls come backstage. Mm. And my manager just, like, took us out of there and we were gone. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It was kind of odd. It was kind of weird. Yeah. So now you have R. Kelly's phone number. He wants you to call him. And we learned from the docu-series, one of your girlfriends encouraged you to call, and he wanted you to go out to dinner. Did you talk to your family about that first? Like your mom, did any of your parents know you were going out to dinner with R. Kelly? Um, well, I was very reluctant to even call. I was very nervous. Mm -hmm. um, I had been trying to get a career going, and... Um, my parents, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get too much into the relationship with my parents because, um, they're not here to t tell, you know, their side or whatever, but, um, we weren't very close mm -hmm. and I saw a lot of things growing up, things that I shouldn't have really been exposed to. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like I was on my own, but I also felt like I had a responsibility to help these people and try to make something out of myself. So... That was a major motivation to call because I'm like, maybe this is my big break. You know, mm -hmm, like my mm -hmm. friend was put, pushing it on me. But we, let me clear, clarify something right now. Okay. For all these people want to say, fast, let me, let, no, let me say this right now. All every, everyone out there, oh, fast girls. Ain't no fast girl over here. I was a cheerleader. I was on the debate team. Okay. I was an inspiring singer. I was, a, I was a triple threat and I was a good girl. Okay. So a predator is a predator. Mm -hmm. Do not blame the little girl walking in the mall that has stars in her eyes. I was 17. I was not 37. Well, you set that straight. <laughs> and so yeah. you met him. But I'm you know sorry, what? But how many girls you know would be like that today? Say like if the young girls today saw Chris Brown, it would be the same thing. If they saw Chris Brown in the mall, Chris Brown wanted them to call. It's the same thing back then. It was R. Kelly. Today it could be Chris Brown or Jacquees. It's the same but, thing. But, mm -hmm. Right. But it wasn't like I wanted a romantic relationship with the guy. Like I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to. It wasn't like that. It was me trying to do something for myself mm -hmm. and him taking advantage of that because he promised certain things and the relationship started out as a professional type of thing mm -hmm. and then turned into whatever it turned into what I spoke about. But that's the thing that I want to clarify is that I wasn't like, Oh my God, I'm going to be with this guy. No, that was the furthest thing from my mind. Mm -hmm. When did he find out that you were a singer? The same night, the same night, because, I mean, his, you know, his manager was there. We went to the dinner. It was very cool, you know, with my girlfriend and I and a few of his, you know, his, his uh, posse mm -hmm. and crew and his manager. And he happened to be Aaliyah's uncle. And so, you know, right away we were talking, well, how old are you guys? Well, we're 17. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. And then are you in high school? Yes, we're seniors in high school. Okay, so what do you guys do? That was like, it was like an interview type of thing. So he knew and then he put you his hand on my leg. Mm. So after he found out yes. you were seventeen yes. and in high school, then he puts his hand on your leg. Interesting. Okay. Yes, yes, and I was very uncomfortable. I was very uncomfortable. I was not comfortable with that, and I kind of like put his hand like to the side. But. You know, you're young, mm -hmm. you know, then it was like, okay, well, now we're going to go to the studio. And then I'm like, okay, well, let's go to the studio. And then I sat down and sang and everything was great. And then I'm thinking like, okay, here we go. And then it was like a tongue was in my mouth. Mm -hmm. And it's just like. You, you know, it's interesting though, Lizette. You can't. This this sort of what, what I wanted to yeah. say to you, because I, I want to speak to parents out there and parents who have daughters. And I had to talk to my daughter about this because. 
You could be in a situation where, like you said, this is your big moment. This could be your big break. And although you felt uncomfortable, mm -hmm. it's like it's like you want to say no, but then you don't want to miss an opportunity. And then sometimes you feel like you don't mm -hmm. want to offend the person. And so it's a whole lot of mixed emotions that a young person has to try to decipher really quickly that they really don't understand. And so going through exactly you being 17 and so I, I i totally get that so it's like okay although he made you feel uncomfortable but this could be a big break and you don't want to tell him no because then you don't want him to, you don't want to lose the attention because who knows this could be my next big break i can help my family so that's the only reason why i'm talking through that because some people may say you know well, she should have just went on ahead and left then but there was something else that was going on and young people have to learn those emotions so that's all i want to say okay now you said his, right. his tongue went well to thank mouth. you for saying that but i also but i also would like to say that that was not the first time that i was abused mm. so when you're abused there's something that happens in your mind where it's like someone's coming on to you and you've been in that situation and you just kind of like, okay, this is happening and you're a kid. So I can't really, I don't know if I'm articulating the right mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. but it was like, um, okay, here we go again. Type of, okay. You know, I was a wounded kid. So, you know, people need to have compassion for that too and understand the full story. And d Lifetime did not share a lot of what I, shared with them about my background, which I'm not, you know, I like Lifetime, but I feel like what was lacking was actually explaining who these, who we were before and leading up to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And There's a deeper story. Right. And that's why I wanted to talk to you because I know you shared with me uh, last week that there was 300 hours I was actually taped, but we only saw really six hours and we only saw clips of each individual. And we're going to get back to the R. Kelly story, but I want to know who were you before you met him? Before you met R. Kelly, you said you were a cheerleader, you were on the debate team. We just learned that you were also a victim of abuse before you met him. But tell us who you were. I was a funny girl. I was a shy girl. I was quiet most of the time. I loved my family to death. I loved my father so much, and my father wasn't around. I didn't really have a male figure. I had my stepdad, but it's not the same thing. There was always a void there, mm -hmm. but I made the best of it, and I did not live in the best circumstances. You know, I, like I said, I'm not going to go into it too much, but I... I made the best of my circle, and my circle was my life and what I like to do. I saw myself, and I wanted to have an out. I did not want to end up like the people that I was seeing every single day. I had high aspirations, you know. I was an avid reader. I would read Judy Bloom books in the bathtub for two hours. You know, I loved music. I used to sing along to my mother was a huge Motown fan. We had like, Motown, you know, record fans and artists, and we had records in their house, and I would sing to Linda Rodstein. I learned how to sing at a very young age because I would have to go in the room to avoid situations and just find something that I love. Wow. And that's who I was. And so now A little girl alone, alone mm -hmm. most of the time. Wow. So now so it's in, easy for you to be preyed upon. Yeah. So now in steps are Kelly. So you have this uncomfortable situation in the studio. And um, like you said, he put his tongue in your mouth. After that, what happened? After that, um, his friend was trying to hit up my girlfriend. And my girlfriend was real like, I don't play that stuff, <laughs> and she was a lot older, mm -hmm. a lot wiser. <laughs> She's still my best friend to this day. We're like Thelma and Louise, mm -hmm. and she says, Liz, let's go, and we left, and she said, well, you know, they seem really interested in your singing. I think you need to, like, just focus on that, but like I said, we were kids, because um, me today, I would have been, I would have hit him with a frying pan over his head or something, <laughs> I don't know. Or, you know, just walked out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> or just whatever, walked out of there, you know. But like I said, my mind was not totally developed mm -hmm. to understand these situations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just, be we were friends. We were friends. Nothing really happened too much. 
Um, nothing inappropriate happened after that. Um, it was more like, I'm going to help you. You know, Barry was going to help, you know, not that Barry was going to help me, but Barry was always very nice to me. Mm -hmm. very nice to me. And he said one day, I called the house and he said, um, I'd like to speak with you, but not over the phone in person. Hmm. And I said, okay. And he sounded kind of concerned, but we never got a chance to talk. And I really feel in my heart that he was going to basically tell me, get away. Interesting. Now, when you got with R. Kelly, was this before the child pornography case? Or after? Yes, it was right. It was right after the annulment of the wedding, of uh, the marriage between him and Aaliyah. Interesting. Now I know that, and I like to say that also at the dinner table, my best friend that I told you, who's mm -hmm. really ballsy, asked them, "What did he? Did you marry her?" And he said, "Don't believe everything you hear." And there was total silence at the table. And Barry, so we there. did confront them about that. And and Barry was at the right. table, Aaliyah's uncle. Yes. <laughs> wow. That's very, that's just very interesting that he was at the table and you asked him about R. Kelly marrying his niece and so no then, one said course, anything. Right. So then, right. So then you think to yourself, oh, that's, you know, then it must not be true. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, why would answer. the uncle. Mm -hmm. say, right. Yeah. Why would he keep silent and why wouldn't he say anything if it was true? So how long were you and R. Kelly friends before you what? guys actually started dating? Just a few months, and then it wasn't, I can't really say dating. It was like, it turned very weird very quickly. When you, what do you I mean, mean like, you? sex and, it just, I became like a sexual, just like a thing hmm. to him. And at this point, I mean, my depression set in. My grades went down the tubes. I uh, wasn't living at my parents' house. Mm. And it just didn't, it just went, it went left real quick. Now, did he live in Florida at the time? Was he living in Florida? Because I know you were in Florida. Was he living there? Or was he still he was Chicago? like, I, he was living, he was renting a home in Florida and also going back and forth to Chicago. Okay. But he loved Miami. How long were you two together in total? Well, you know, I know you don't know if your boyfriend, girlfriend, but how long were you with him? Four years. Four years. About four years. So during this, mm -hmm. did he did he take you like to concerts? Did he take you to the studio? Did he, you know? Yeah, we went to concerts. We, we, I was I was in that studio during that whole um, second album of his. Really, it's titled Arcade. I was, I was in that booth most of the time through, throughout all those songs. Because I, I know you said that you did not know he was married to Andrea Kelly, that they had even gotten married. So you didn't know anything about her? No. No, I don't think the world knew anything about her. It was very <laughs> quiet. It, I was... <laughs> so did y'all live together? I'm just saying, I have a lot of respect for her. Mm-hmm. No, we never lived together. Okay. And I never lived in a house with girls. We never did that. I, like, what I know, that wasn't happening. Okay. Where there were girls living in a house and there was a cult type of thing going on. I was more of like, I became like a... And then I would stay in Chicago for like a few months in a hotel. Then I'd go back home. Then there were times where I didn't know how I was going to get back home because he couldn't be found. Hmm. It just became a nightmare. So, did you ever want to leave? That's a night a... Hello? I'm sorry? Did you ever want to leave the situation? Did you ever just I... want to leave him and leave the relationship? I did, but I loved him okay. at that point. You know, I cared about him because we were very good and then we were very bad. Hmm. And then it was like, oh, I was sexually abused, and then I was sexually abused. Hmm. So we had a common thing there. Okay. And listen, when Robert's beautiful, he's beautiful. When Robert's a monster, he's a monster. So, you know, when you're in an abusive relationship, that's what goes on. There's a honeymoon phase. There's an abusive phase. 
Then there's a, you know, let me drag you down the hallway by your arm at the Marriott Hotel. Mm. And then there's let me write you a song. So it's a vicious cycle. It's just so sick. And I felt like I didn't have anything because at this point I didn't. So you say he was beautiful and he was a monster. Would you be able to explain and yes. describe both of those people? So describe the, the beautiful R. Kelly that you knew. Who was he? Who was that person? What was he's he like? He's funny. He's funny. He's, he's funny. He's loving. Mm -hmm. He's uh, creatively. Uh, he's a genius. I mean, these songs that were written were beautiful songs. And then there would be another song about, you know, step in my room and I'm going to do this to you. So it's like, there's a, you know, there's a lot of two different people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's fine. You know, you're expressing yourself. However, there's also, you know, uh, don't look at anyone while you're sitting at the table except me or I'll take you outside and smack you. Why was that? Why, why so, didn't you look at anybody? I don't, you know, that's an insecurity thing that he had. I didn't understand that when I was a kid. That was my first relationship. I didn't understand this. I thought this was what normal, this is a normal thing. And listen, as I said, growing up, I saw a lot of things that kind of mirrored what I went on to live. Mm, okay. So describe the monster. He was described, they used the word monster. What did he do? What made him a monster? I mean, there were times where I was in a car and very, you know, I have to sit there and, oh, come on, give me fellatio, you know, go, give me oral sex. And then your friends are sitting in the back seat. That's humiliating. Mm. That's humiliating. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, things like that. Things of like I'm at the hotel and people are following me and I'm just trying to walk around because I've been in the hotel for weeks. And I haven't heard from anyone and I don't have any money to get home. Mm. Just mm. cruel stuff that you don't do to someone. You don't do to, you don't do that to people. Very mental. And that's what the world needs to understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a mental, it was a lot of mental, mm -hmm. mental abuse. Strip you for who you are. And I know the public, his fans, they love him. And I know it's hard to hear all these things. But I don't have anything to gain from sitting here in my house right now, talking to Lady Charmaine to bring up, to make up stories. For what? I'm not getting paid to do this. Mm -hmm. I know it's hard to accept, but you need to accept that this is a person. This person needs a lot of help. And at this point, it's probably going to be help in jail. Um, many people are hoping that many people are hoping to now was there ever physical I know you said he dragged you down the hall or if you looked at somebody who'll smack you did he ever take the abuse to a whole mm -hmm. nother level um it wasn't you know I hear a lot of things of the you night know, like 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 leaving them in the in the car and locked up in the car I didn't go through those things mm -hmm. what I went through is my truth and what I say I got smacked sometimes I got uh, dragged down hallways. Mm -hmm. I got, you know, I can't, no money to eat. You're stuck at a hotel. You can't get a hold of anyone. You know, Robert's nowhere to be found. And I'm sitting there crying. And, you know, it's just like a lot of mental abuse and some physical abuse that shouldn't have happened. And it's just disgusting. How many of his... For me, he's taken his... He's taken his uh, predatory and abusive uh, stuff to a whole nother level when I hear now, and that's why I came out, because it's been happening for way too long. And if people want to do their research, you, there were a lot of losses with underage women. But they got to call Jim DeRogotis at BuzzFeed and ask him and look online, because this is not something that we're making, that the survivors are making up. There's a lot more survivors that are going to start coming up soon. Wow. So, um, wow, this, this is just, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> I mean, it, it's literally just a lot. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. It, it, no I'm it's just good, a though. passionate person. No, no, it, it, no, it, it's good. Thank you. So when did you, did you ever tell him, I want to leave? Did you ever say that? I want, I want to leave. You ever tell him that? There were times where I'm just like, I'm done with you. 
And what did and you say? And then it said crying. No, I love you. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. I love you. I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I just have, you know, issues. Or, but, you know, I love you. But this is another thing. You always want to be with your friends. Your family doesn't like me. Mm. Nobody likes me. They're jealous. And, they, 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 you know, that's the mind mm -hmm. screw that he does. Mm -hmm. So you believe those lies. And the abuser cries. You believe those lies because at this point, mm -hmm. the, exactly, because you broken down. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even look in the mirror. And I was a beautiful young woman. I had a lot going for myself. And for me, all the life that I had in me, to not even be able to look at myself in the mirror and like who's looking back at me at the hands of someone else is awful. When this abuse was going on, did he have other people around that actually saw him physically hit you and they just didn't do anything or say anything? Well, you know, the one time, I don't want to get too much, uh, um, but the one time that, the first time, it's not the one time, the first time that we were like around people, hmm. they were in the restaurant and he took me outside and basically smacked me and then cried afterwards. So I'm pretty sure they knew stuff was going on, but they were not actually, like, in the vicinity, like, right outside with me. Mm -hmm. But I came back and I was crying. And then I was trying to fix, like, my face and my makeup or whatever little thing I had going on. And he was, like, he, again, one, another humiliation. Real women do not sit at a table and fix their makeup. I'm like, I'm a kid. Like, you just hit me outside. Like, mm. I'm scared to even go to the bathroom. Oh, wow. So, how long were you with him when you found out that he was married, that he had gotten married to Andrea? I never, I never knew about her. But I never knew about her. But when you found out, were you guys maybe I was under a rock? I mean, when I found out, no, right. no, mm. no, no. So you found out it after was after. You broke. Really? And that. And actually, my friend is the one who told me, and she was like, "I heard that he got married." And I'm like, okay, well, when? And she's like, well, I don't know, one of the dancers. And that's basically how I found out. Like, I didn't even know if it was true. So when he, but was, at that point, I didn't care. I was, I was over it. Because my question is, when he was going places, when you guys were together, and you weren't there, where did you think he was going? Or what did he say he was? We going? were never. We never. We, we never lived together. So he was able Robert to do those is a very secretive person. Okay. Of course, because he would say, oh, I'm going to the studio. And mm -hmm. Robert likes to work at night and, like, all night. And then come and then say, we're going to sleep in the closet because he doesn't like the light. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like the windows to have, you know, the light that's coming, shining in because so, he wants to sleep all day. Mm -hmm. So I got tired of that, and I'm like, I don't want to go. So that was like, you know, listen, I would go downstairs to the, ho the hotel lobby and see other young women there. And I knew. And whenever I would call him out and say, I know that you have other girls here, all hell would break loose. I wouldn't see him for days. And then he would come back and start fighting with me hmm. and saying I'm too slick with my mouth because I was started to get tired of it. You know, I, I started to understand that I was one among many. Mm -hmm. I'm dealing with all this BS. And this person's playing me like crazy. Now, you were 17 when you and got And who, who knows, you know? Lizette. Yes, you were I 17. was a 17-year-old kid. Did he go to your high school graduation? Yes. He, so he attended your high school graduation? No. Oh. <laughs> no. No. I didn't. I, no. He didn't go to my high school graduation. <laughs> He didn't go to my prom, you know, he was, he stood clear of that, but he <laughs> will, would say, oh, well, who are you going to go to prom with? I didn't even go to prom with that. I went with my best friend. Mm. I went with, I went with some guys there that had no interest in us. We had no interest, but it was a bunch of, a, a group of us. And that was it. He wanted to know who you're going to go to the prom with. Isn't that interesting? You were 17. Yeah. How, how old was he when you guys got together? How old was he? Uh, he was 27. And then by the time I went to prom, I was 18, so he was 28. We're 10 years apart. 
Okay, so he was 28 years old. And we also learned in the, we also learned in the story that he uh, passed on mononucleosis. But you said from that you developed something else that actually caused you to become paralyzed. How did mono give us the name of that? And how did mononucleosis turn into that? What did the doctor say? Well, mononucleosis is a viral disease. It's a kissing disease. You can get it, you know. And then I was so sick. It was such a high load of it, the, the, whatever that virus was mm -hmm. in my body. Uh, the doctor said, you need to stay home. And I, I'm a person that I move around a lot. I can't just, I started to feel better. And then I started to, like, do my normal activities. And then it turned into Guillain-Barre. And Guillain-Barre, like, a lot of people don't know about it because it's, like, it comes, it comes like, every 30 years you'll hear about, like, an outbreak of, like, not an outbreak, but you hear about some cases. It's very rare. Mm. But it basically, like, tears down your nervous system. And so I started to become paralyzed. It started with my toes and moved mm. to my knee, like, my legs. I couldn't walk, my face. I couldn't smile. Mm. I was nearly dead. Wow. Like, literally, the, the doctor said to my father, prepare for a funeral, because I don't think she's going to come out of it. Her lungs are going to collapse soon. Mm. And by the grace of God, I had a, I had a praying grandmother <laughs> who would take the bus, three buses, to get to the hotel, to the hotel, to the hospital. <laughs> I had a praying grandmother who would take three buses to get to my room at that hospital, and she would do the rosary on her knees for hours. Mm. And miraculously... I got out of it, but I had to go through occupational therapy. I had to learn how to hold them spoon again. Like I was really messed up. Now, were you with R. Kelly when this happened or were you guys broken up? No, we were together, but once again, he was nowhere to be found. Mm. And someone is asking, what was your breaking point to finally break loose of him? Um, after getting sick, you know, um, you know, I never shared this with anyone. I'm going to share it with you because okay. I feel like it tonight. After I got sick and I recovered, I said, no more. I'm going to get a regular job. I'm going to give up on this singing thing because I don't want to go through this. And I'm done. Hmm. And I got an apartment. And I kind of, like, set up my life. And I went to Chicago to see a friend who had been dating his cousin mm. in Chicago. We knew each other. And she was having a baby. Mm -hmm. Not by the cousin, but they were still friends. But, I, you know, I didn't keep contact with him. But I kept in contact with her. She was a good friend of mine. She used to keep me company when he would leave and disappear and leave me for, you know, mm -hmm. stuff at a hotel. She would always, she would bring me food. She was, like, my really good friend. So I went to visit her, and the last day I was there, he called. Mm. And he said, and the phone rings, and I'm, like, sleeping on the couch getting ready, and I'm going to pack my stuff in a few hours and get ready to go. And she said, well, Rob's on the phone. And I said, I don't even want to talk to him. And she was like, come on, talk to him. So I said, whatever. So I picked up the phone, and I said, hey. And he's like, you know what, I'm in Atlantic City, but I'm go I want to come back. I'm going to come back tomorrow. Please stay. And I said, you know what? I already set up my life. I just don't trust you. Mm. And he was married already. <laughs> and I, I'm okay. And he said, I made a mis I made a, yeah, I made a mistake. Please stay. And I told him, he said, I'll pay you. I'll pay you any amount of money that you're going to make at that job. I'll do whatever. And you know what I said? No, thank you. Mm. I said, I'm going back to my life. You almost killed me. I got to go. And I hung up the phone. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you that you didn't mm. fall for the okie doke. And so when you broke up. And I saw him. I, yeah. So you I were saw what, him 22? after I had the kids too. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was he trying to get you back then? It's a weird story. Like, only my intimate friends know about this, but I had the twins. I, I hadn't gone out in a long time. I was, like, not into it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, giving birth to twins. and you know, But my friend said, oh, come on, let's go out for a little while. And we went to South Beach. And we're walking. 
and uh, there was some party going on, and she was like, I really want to go, so I said, okay, so let's go. So we were going in, and I see a, uh, a tour bus, and my stomach just went upside down. I said, oh, my God, that's Rob. And mm-hmm. she was like, how the hell do you know that's Rob? I said, I just know. So we, like, we're crossing the street, and he jumps out the tour bus with his friends, and he's like, set, set. He used to call me set. Mm. And I turned around, I'm like, oh, my God. Mm. And he was like, please come with me now. Again, please mm. come with me now and grab my hand. And I told him, I'm sorry, I can't. And I walked away. You go, girl. Good for you. So what was that in you that caused that separation for you to literally let him go? What strength was that? Because, you know, I remembered who I was before that situation mm-hmm. and what, what happened to me. Wow. And I wasn't going to allow him to continue on with me because I'm not a sex slave. Mm-hmm. I'm not nobody's prostitute. Okay, good, bad, or indifferent. My mother did not raise me like that. Yeah, I know that's right. And I, you know, I had to reach deep inside because I did love him. And I cared about the little boy who was in there who was abused. Mm-hmm. But I cared about myself more. For the first time, I loved myself more. That is the absolute key that I think most people need to understand. You loved you first. Because a lot of times people put their abusers Mm -hmm. first and how their abuser feels. But finally you put you first and you said, I love me better than that. And I love me more than that. So you was able to put yourself first. Oh my goodness. And that comes with time. That comes with time, Mm -hmm. Lady Charlemagne. That's Charmaine. That comes with time. You know, that's not something that comes overnight when you've been stripped. And you've been abused your entire life. You know, that that comes with time. And that's what people need to understand. I don't need to come out and talk about it when you want me to come and talk about it. I talk about it when I feel like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there's a process that you go through. And you live with it. And you live with it. Mm -hmm. You live with it. But it doesn't go away. These are experiences that at a young age mold your life. You think I wanted my life to turn out that way? No. Hmm. But it is what it is. And today I'm here as a voice for the voiceless, as a person that has given her life to save others. Because that's the only thing I can come up with there. Why my whole life I've been through these situations? Hmm. Why? Because there's a purpose. God has a purpose for me. And that's why I go through my stuff, but I remember... That I'm a messenger. And I need to be a lifesaver. All right. It ain't about the glitz and glamour. It's not about the glitz. There's no, uh, nobody want to be famous for this. All right. Stop while you're ahead. Nobody wants to be famous for this. But when you have a calling, when God says you are a wounded person, you've been through so much, but you have a lot of wisdom and you speak from your heart and you need to help other women and you, other young men as well. Cause men are, men are abused as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's why I'm standing right now. What would you tell young people, especially somebody you, you're, if you knew what you knew now at the age of 17, what would you say to yourself, especially about predators, not just R. Kelly, but people that have that predatory spirit? What would you tell people to look out for today? First of all, Someone who wants to control you does not have your best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. They're looking out for themselves. Mm -hmm. They have a sick way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Someone that wants to help you is genuine and professional. Okay? They're not going to put their hand on your your, your knee in your lap the first day they meet you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You don't need anyone to validate you. Your talent should stand on its own. And parents as well, need to speak to their kids. Especially, I wanted to talk to the fathers tonight. Okay? Because mm-hmm. unfortunately, yeah, I had a father, but my father wasn't around. And I love him to this day, and I'm not bashing him. I love him, I love him, I love him, I love him, I love him. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have that foundation of a father, of you're my princess, 
you don't need anything from anyone. I'm going to help you. Right. I didn't have that. Wow. So it's easy for someone to infiltrate because, you know, predators can see the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They can spot the vulnerability in you. And then and if they've been abused, they can see and they know who has been abused. Mm. That's, a, that's a fact. Wounded people run together. Mm. Interesting. What do you, can you tell me some of those things so that I want, wounded I, people before you go there? Because you said wounded people basically, as they used to say, game recognized game. What are some of those things that a predator that's been wounded, like R. Kelly? What are some of those th things that they can recognize in a wounded person that they can identify with? Do you know what that is? Someone, you know, like for me, I accepted things early on, mm -hmm. and someone who is not used to going through stuff like that mm -hmm. would be like, okay, this is weird and I'm getting up and I'm leaving. But a person who has been abused um, accepts certain behavior because that's what they conditioned to understand that that's what their life has been. Mm -hmm. So that's the normalcy in it. Okay. You know, it's a lot of control, a lot of control and wanting to, Strip you of who you are, mm -hmm. and anyone that loves you does not do that to you, and anyone that has your best interest does not do that to you. They're supporters, they're not haters. Right. Wow. So, what do you wish you would have known then that you know now? That I was worth more. That even though all these people that hurt me hurt me. Mm -hmm. I was worth a lot more. And it's not my fault. Mm -hmm. And that there is more to life than, than being abused and then being taken advantage of. And I just thought, I wish someone would have said, you know, like, was that, you don't, Run away. That's not for you. That person wants to harm you. That person wants to use you. You got me over here tearing all up myself. <laughs> I'm like, who? Because that, that, that's, that's really real. If, if we knew our value and when you know your worth. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Knowing your worth, knowing your value. And knowing that very I, early. And the funny thing is, very early on, mm -hmm. you have to inject it. That's why I inject it to my kids all day. <laughs> You're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Inside, more than out. Because, you know, what matters is inside. Mm -hmm. You know, not in the entertainment business. You know, they want to dissect you and make you into, like, what you have to be. What, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're beautiful inside. You're beautiful. All right? I don't want to hear that. Mm-hmm. We are all beautiful and we all have talents, okay? And no one has the right to take that away from you. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Lizette, I want to say thank you so much for sharing your story on the show. Thank you for just opening up. I definitely got some nuggets out of what you shared tonight. And thank you for just being open. Thank you for just being honest. Thank you for being transparent. I know that there is a lot of healing that's, you know, still taking place within you. Have you gotten a chance to meet the other girls that were also in the docuseries or any other parents? I've met, I'm very close friends with the families, with the Clarys and, uh, and the Savages. And that's the reason why I came out because I heard Timothy Savage and his plea mm -hmm. for the world to listen up before any documentary. They've been fighting for two, and, you know, two plus years. Mm -hmm. And um, the women, I've met them. I love them. I support them. Unfortunately, you know, we met in New York and our, our, our time was cut because, uh, Someone felt the need to uh, call in a gun threat, which is a whole nother story. But um, we bonded, we, you know, and we got to know each other. We don't share war stories. We're just wanting to know how we're doing today mm -hmm. and support each other. And that's where we're at. That's wonderful. At least, you know, you have other people that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you can look at one another and just be like, I well, know. You don't need to say what you went through, but it's just you got that connection 
I know. <laughs> of you course. Know. Mm-hmm. And it's so disturbing that after 30 years, I mean, we have to go meet other people that have been through the same thing. I mean, that's the most disturbing thing mm-hmm. of this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Like, this has been going on for way too long. And if Robert's listening, listen, Robert, you need a lot of help. Like, you seriously need to stop. Like, it's just way too much. Mm-hmm. Way too much. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for sharing it's, your story. You're destroying lives. Okay. Thank you. Uh, destroying no, lives. Mm-hmm. Destroying lives. <laughs> you are For serious. 30 years, destroying lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I pray that the girls that he currently <laughs> have, my prayer is that he's able to let them go. And I know God has the power to do that. So the power of prayer. So again, thank you for coming on the That's show. Right. Thank Amen. you for sharing you your know, story. God is big. God yes, is huge. big. God is huge. And we love God. And mm-hmm. we, he's, he, he's above everything. <laughs> and he's watching everything. And, you know, it ain't going to stay the same. It's not going to stay like this because this is too much suffering going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. So hold ho, one moment. Okay, hold on. Well, again, I want to thank my guests for coming on the show today. That was Miss Lizette Martinez. You may have seen her in the docuseries Surviving R. Kelly. If you have not gone to see it, make sure you go online to Lifetime and catch it on demand. It is such a powerful, powerful story. You're going to hear the stories of other ladies and also parents who R. Kelly still have their daughters. So I want you guys to go ahead and, and pray. If you, have, if you believe in the power of God, pray for those that have been affected and for the young ladies that he still have, because prayers are definitely needed. Again, thank you so much to everyone that tuned in tonight to our special Hot Topics with Lady Charmaine and my special guest, Miss Lizette Martinez.